All right, I'm gonna show you how this character can use every style of weapons, even all in the same turn if we happen to want to. We can use ranged attacks, we can use melee attacks, and they're both extremely effective. We can use unarmed attacks, we can stun, we can knock enemies prone, we can fear enemies, name a thing, and this character can do it. We're gonna lead off with a ranged attack with the potential to frighten our target because that's how we'll often start combats with this character. They passed the save, but that's okay. We have a lot more options. All right, we do have to wait for Astarian, who is casting Sanctuary on himself and then entering Umbral Shroud. So Astarian has elected not to participate in this combat. I really love that uh, this has nothing to do with this character, but I really love that the combat started and Astarian just hid immediately. I should also note that we have no pre-buffs. You can see here, no pre-buffs and uh, very minimal gear on this character right now. So in real play, your actual damage will be significantly higher. Um, let's go ahead and use our second action to land a stunning strike, see if we can get a stun going. Uh, sure, let's have an ally help out there. So we've now stunned them, and then let's see if we can get a topple going and knock them over. And now they're stunned and on the ground. They're not yet frightened, but we can probably do that too. So let's go ahead and make a menacing attack against this prone enemy. Actually, the Oathbreaker Knight's immune to fear, so that will never, uh, that'll never matter. But then we can go ahead and do another attack. Um, let's just bring it on home with yet another menacing attack. And so that shows you that we have done uh, unarmed strikes, melee attacks, ranged attacks, lots of crowd control conditions all in a single turn of combat. Obviously in actual play you won't be doing these all in the same turn, but I just wanted to show off how many different playstyles this character can use all at once, and how good it is at locking down enemies. Alright, let's get to the build. Hello my friends, and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 character building guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're covering the most versatile fighter in Baldur's Gate 3, a character that can use any combat style, from ranged to melee to unarmed attacks, controlling enemies and damaging them all in a single package. This character can therefore fit into any party and can adapt its playstyle to face whatever you need in a given encounter. I've been a bit on a bit of a kick lately of doing sort of undercovered combos or uh, combinations of classes that people don't usually consider, and this is definitely one of them, and I think it's actually an extremely powerful class combination that does not get as much coverage as it deserves. I'm talking about fighter and monk together, which lets us combine all of the, the power and control of the monk and all of the damage and tankiness of the fighter into a single package, using every weapon and playstyle in a single character. Normally in Dungeons and Dragons, you get your raw power from your martial characters and your versatility from your spellcasters. That's a very broad generalization, but that's typically how you should think about uh, structuring a party. This character basically gets all the versatility of a spellcaster and all the raw power of a martial character all wrapped up into a single character with incredible damage, incredible control, and the ability to switch your playstyle on the fly based on what you need for that encounter. As a result, it's also super fun because you actually have to change your strategy from encounter to encounter or can change your strategy from encounter to encounter, um, whereas often a lot of characters will fall into the trap of just hitting the same button over and over again throughout the entire playthrough. This character is going to vary its playstyle significantly, and so I find it a blast to play. Before I get into building the character, I do want to take a moment to say thank you so much to Michael Henderson for the $3, uh, Ryan Hoffman for the £5 donation, Elliot Dent for the £20, Recrit for the 10 euros, and Good Psychiatry for becoming a channel member. Thank you so much, my friends. I really do appreciate the support. It really means a lot. All right, let's get in and start building the true master of battle, the most versatile fighter in Baldur's Gate 3. I'm using Lazel here as the example character, because I think this build is perfectly on flavor for her. It's all about mastery of warfare, which is of course something she excels at, and in the game we see Githyanki training to fight both with weapons and with fists and feet, so she is going to have a lot of background in all of the techniques that we're using here. Special mention also both for Karlak, who benefits from her soul coin feature, giving you additional damage on the unarmed strikes that this build does, and for Astarian, whose late game story event lets him add a 
whole bunch of damage to all of the many, many attacks that this build dishes out. Both of those are excellent choices as well. And if you're doing this as a custom character, then I would recommend all of the usual suspects. Uh, Dwergar for the enlarge and invisibility outside of combat. Wood Elf for the bonus movement speed. Um... Or Githyanki is actually very good, because the bonus action Misty Step works very well for this character as well, which otherwise doesn't get access to Misty Step, so the once-per-day Misty Step can be very helpful, especially for melee characters to close distance, and ranged characters to get away from enemies, and this character is both. We're going to begin with a fighter level, because that gets us proficiency in every single weapon, and for the most versatile character, of course, we want to have the most broadest array of weapon proficiencies, and of course it also gets us all armors and shield proficiencies as well, so we can use any of the gear that we come across. We're going to take also a very greedy stat split, because we only actually need three attributes at all on this character. The secret that makes this character work is that we get to combine everything that we need into a single attribute, and that is Dexterity, which is, not so secretly, the best attribute in Dungeons & Dragons. Dexterity gives you so much for just a single attribute, so if you can use it as your damage attribute, not only does it work for damage, it also gives you armor class, if you are using light or medium armor, one of the uncapped medium armors. It gives you uh, saving throws that, one of the good saving throws, it applies to basically every damaging spell, targets dexterity, so it's one of the most important saving throws, and it gives you the most important stat in the game, initiative, allowing you to go first in every combat. All of those things, in addition to being your damage stat, means that this character is entirely single attribute dependent, or sad, which is actually a good thing, and so we get to take 17 dexterity, 16 Constitution, and 15 Wisdom as our starting attributes, because we don't need any of these other stats. The secret here is that monks get the ability to use any weapon with dexterity, except for two-handed weapons, so long as they're proficient with it. Monks normally are only proficient with a very narrow array of weapons, so there's a small subset of weapons that they can use, but fighters are proficient with every weapon, so this gives us dexterity-based attacks with every non-two-handed weapon in the game, and that includes versatile weapons, so you can still use some weapons that are held in two hands, just not any weapon with the two-handed property. That lets us get away with putting everything, going all in on dexterity, having the best stat in the game be our highest stat, and allowing us to use every weapon based off of that for full damage and, and attack rolls. We also get access to uh, our skills here, and your skill selection for this character really doesn't matter. This is not going to be a, an important uh, skill character, but if you want to take a background that gives you slight, sleight of hand and stealth, like Urchin, um, then that will allow this character to be your lockpicking character as well. So if you're building this as a custom character, I do highly recommend doing that. For a fighting style here, you have a lot of options, and there's actually a lot of different ways you could go. For a sort of default character, you could take defense, just plus one armor class is always incredible. But for th uh, and if you intend to be using specific weapons or specific setups, you could go with dueling or great weapon fighting. Both of those are also very useful. But to emphasize versatility, we're actually going to take archery fighting style. Archery fighting style is incredibly powerful. A plus two bonus to hit is a massive boost to your attacks. In fact, if you compare it to sort of a normal monk build, which uses tavern brawler, right, in order to get the plus five bonus to hit with your strength, you get two fifths of one of the most broken effects in the entire game game just from this one level of fighter on your ranged attacks, allowing you to uh, hit much more reliably with your ranged attacks. So archery fighting style gives you a whole extra layer of abilities in combat, so you can use both very powerful melee attacks and very powerful ranged attacks all on the same character. That's level one, let's go to level two. At level 2, we're going to immediately dip out and take our monk level. Now, you might be wondering, you know, monks normally want to be unarmed, they want to be unarmored, but as it turns out, Almost all of Monk's features work just fine with weapons and just fine in armor. What we lose from wearing weapons and armor is we lose unarmored defense, but armor is just better than unarmored defense anyways. It's going to give us more AC than uh, having unarmored defense. The reason Monks are normally unarmored is that they can't wear armor, so the ability to wear armor is, is good. And we lose at later levels fast movement, but at low levels we don't actually lose anything. Our dexterous attacks still work, so our monk weapons will still scale off of our dexterity, and like I said, any weapon you're proficient with that's not a two-handed weapon is a monk weapon. Um, 
and we get uh, the ability to add our bonus action unarmed strike whenever we hit with a weapon. That means that we now are making two attacks per round, applying our full dexterity on the offhand attack, unlike if we were dual wielding weapons at this point in the game, which is extremely powerful and gives fighters gives this fighter a use for their bonus action that fighters normally don't get. In fact, one weakness of fighter as a class is that normally they don't have amazing uses for their bonus action. This completely solves that by adding in unarmed strike every turn and flurry of blows whenever you have key points for it for two or even three attacks every single turn starting at, at second level using your full attribute modifier and doing uh, all of the bonus damage and effectiveness from a weapon. One of the best weapons to use in the very early game also is the torch, just because it is going to work very well as a one-handed weapon. It's better than a longsword, so keep that in mind if you're uh, for the first few levels before you get access to other one-handed weapons that you're going to use. No other decisions to make at level 2, so we are going to move on to level 3. And we're going to go back into Fighter. This gives us Action Surge, so now we can make, uh, at level 3, four attacks in the in uh, the opening round of combat using Action Surge and a Flurry of Blows. That's obviously more attacks than any other character can make at this level, and is an incredible amount of burst damage during one of the hardest points in the game. Level 3 and 4 are often the points at which your Honor Mode runs will end, or your Tactician runs will run into difficulties, because your enemies are, are starting to scale up in power level, but your characters haven't yet come online. This character, because it power spikes so early, thanks to getting Action Surge and Flurry of Blows very, very early on, is going to be an excellent carry for your party throughout the difficult early game because of how much damage you can output in the first turn of combat. You're also quite resilient because you have 16 Constitution and 16 Dexter or 17 Dexterity, but 16 in terms of it's a plus 3 bonus. So you're going to have great AC and great hit points for this stage in the game, especially because we started with Fighter, so we got all the extra hit points from Fighter. Character level 4, we're going to go into Battle Master Fighter, giving us access to a bunch of maneuvers. Maneuvers are very powerful and, of course, are going to let us uh, adapt to whatever situation we find ourselves in because we can use these both with melee weapons and with ranged weapons, and it lets us add yet another use for our combat resources to our party. The maneuvers that we're going to, accept, uh, to select are Precision Attack, which is always great, just helps you land attacks when you really want to land attacks, um, Repost, which lets us use our reaction as well as our action and bonus action incredibly effectively, and because we have high dexterity and good armor uh, class for the early game, enemies will be missing attacks against us a lot, because we'll have the either the best armor available or armor that lets us use our very high dexterity, we have shield proficiency, so even at this early stage in the game, enemies will be missing, allowing you to repost frequently, and so you get a great use for your reaction. I say this frequently, but every character, every turn of uh, combat in Dungeons & Dragons has five resources that they can use. They're action, bonus action, reaction, movement, and concentration. This character now has uses for four of those. Obviously, we're not using concentration because we're not a spellcaster, but it is very rare this early in a character's playthrough to have excellent uses that all contribute to your damage output for all of those resources. Finally, the last one that we're going to take is menacing attack. This is really good because this character has the archery um, fighting style, and menacing attack landed at range basically shuts down melee enemies completely. A melee enemy who fails this frightened effect and becomes frightened cannot move, um, and also has disadvantage on attack rolls, but most importantly can't move, so if you shoot them with an arrow and frighten them with a menacing attack, which you can make very reliable with precision attack, um, then you are going to shut down melee enemies completely in the early game. It's very useful against bosses. It can also trap ranged enemies next to your melee fighters, which in this case includes this one. This character can fire a menacing attack arrow, which is more likely to hit than their melee attacks, because archery fighting style is so good fear an enemy, and then move up next to that enemy while switching to their melee weapon, forcing the enemy to engage with this character. So you can really switch back and forth between how you are engaging in combat every turn. And in fact, it will be good practice to get into with this character to make sure that at the end of your turn, you switch back to your melee weapon set, because you want to be making opportunity attacks, even if you use spent your turn on archery. 
or opportunity attacks and reposts. At fighter level four, we get a feat, and we're going to use it to even out these greedy dexterity, uh, greedy ability scores that we took, getting up to 18 dexterity and 16 wisdom. This gives us really excellent wisdom saves and allows us to pass wisdom saves pretty reliably, which is really good for a character like this. Um, it will also mean that we have really high unarmored AC if that's something that we want at this stage in the game. So if you find that your armor class is better when not wearing armor, it's very possible that that will be the case because we have plus seven to our AC uh, from Dexterity and Monk's Unarmored Defense since we were able to take this uh, attribute split. 17 AC without wearing armor is really high and will be competitive with a lot of characters that are in armor at this stage. So it's going to depend on what specific pieces of armor you've found, but it's definitely an option for you. At fighter level 5, we get extra attack, which obviously is incredibly powerful, and takes the number of attacks we can do in the opening round of combat up from 4 to 6, which is obviously a massive boost, um, giving us an incredible amount of opening damage and, of course, the utility of a full battle master. But it only gets better from here. We go to fighter, fighter level 6 now just to accelerate getting our, our second feat. I think that that is really useful and really important. And there's many options for feats here, and it'll depend a little bit on how you have uh, meshed this character into your party's playstyle. But the feat that I'm going to recommend as a, the best default here is actually going to be Sharpshooter. This lets you do a lot of damage at ranged and in melee both, and so lets you much more easily switch between different strategic postures depending on the situation. Against melee enemies you can play as a ranged character, and against ranged enemies you can play as a melee character both, doing all of the normal damage that a Sharpshooter Action Surge fighter does, which with four attacks with Sharpshooter is a lot of damage, and this is why we took archery fighting style and precision attack to make these uh, very reliable to land. And then if you get into melee, you can swap to doing all of the damage that a melee fighter does as well. You will do slightly less damage than a dedicated two-handed melee character, but not as much less as you'd think, because you get the offhand attacks with flurry of blows and so on. So while your individual attacks will not hit as hard as a two-handed weapon, you will get more of them, and you can add additional damage dice onto those using various effects that increase your damage dice, which I'll talk about in gear, or of course just buffs from your allies. Sharpshooter really helps round out this character, giving them access to all kinds of different strategies, and so I highly recommend taking it, although of course just maximizing your dexterity is never a terrible idea either, so you can definitely do that if you feel like you just aren't using the ranged attacks. At this point, we are now going to go back into Monk. Now, Monk level 2 gets us a bunch of really cool things. Again, all of these do not require you not to be in armor. Uh, this lets you dash and uh, bonus action dash and jump which is going to be a pretty significant distance of travel especially if you are playing as Lazal and can triple your jump distance with step of the wind and also um, disengage which is not terribly useful because this character is just a great melee combatant so you aren't going to want to be disengaging that often patient defense is also very useful for this character because you have great ac so if you want to tie down enemies, you can move up into their space and then use patient defense as a bonus action to give them disadvantage uh, on attack rolls against you. This is not a strategy that you're going to use very regularly because it, it costs you a flurry of blows, it costs you a key point, it is a purely defensive action, but there are definitely circumstances where this comes up. Um, and most of the time you're not you're going to be using Step of the Wind if you're using any of these extra key point actions, but uh, you also are just going to be able to dish out a lot of damage using your flurries. Also, leveling up in Monk, of course, gets us extra key points, so now we can do our flurries more times per day. Then we go to Monk level 3, and we take Way of the Open Hand Monk. This gets us Topple from Flurry of Blows, so now our bonus action can not only uh, damage an enemy 
with two offhand attacks, but also knock them prone, setting us up for our main hand attacks to have advantage, um, which is obviously incredibly powerful. This, incidentally, is also why we didn't select Trip as a Battlemaster maneuver, because we're getting a uh, flurry of blows from open hand. We're getting Topple from open hand Monk. You can also get Stagger, which is very useful to prevent enemies from taking reactions. If this is basically disengage but better because you are actually going to attack the enemy in order to do it um and you can get push which can let you shove enemies off of cliffs or into hazardous effects all incredibly powerful effects and you can you will definitely use all three of these effects in combat this character also gets to do this much more safely than a normal monk because you're a fighter so you've got lots of extra hit points and you have better ac and and so on than your typical monk will have at this point um as well you haven't had to use strength elixirs or anything in order to reach the effectiveness of this level one of the great things about this is it's a dexterity based monk so you don't have to chug strength elixirs if you find that aesthetically displeasing or annoying to do um and while you are not going to reach the incredible hit chance that Tavern Brawler gets because Tavern Brawler is broken, you also don't have the sort of gross taste of abusing the rule set that Tavern Brawler gives you if that's something that bothers you. Then we get an extra feat at Monk level 4. Um, mostly we're taking additional monk levels at this point to add to our key point pool because that's going to let us flurry more often. Um, but the additional feat lets us maximize our dexterity. And then monk level 5, we get Stunning Strike. This adds yet another dimension to this character, so now you have Maneuvers, you have Topple from Flurry of Blows, and you have Stunning Strike. Incidentally, all three of these use the same rules for save DC, so they're going to scale off whatever is higher of your dexterity or strength. So the Stunning Strike save DC, the Battlemaster Maneuver save DC, and the Topple save DC are all going to scale off your dexterity, which is, of course, great because it lets you scale even more stuff off of the single important attribute that matters for this character. This is a little bit late in the game to get Stunning Strike, and there are some enemies that are immune to, to stuns at this point. Another variation of this build that you could do if you value Stunning Strike more than the maneuvers and sort of safer playstyle of the fighter and better weapon access is you could go one fighter into five monk first, but I like getting the early feats first so that we have the archery playstyle available to us much earlier. Um, just wanted to mention that as a possible variation. Stunning Strike in melee also benefits from ha using weapons because it's going to scale the, the hit chance of the Stunning Strike is going to use your weapon enchantment. That seems like sort of a trivial or obvious thing to say, but it means that the, the hit chance compared to an unarmed monk who's not using Tavern Brawler, obviously Tavern Brawler is broken, uses its, its own rules, but a normal dexterity-based monk is going to be much higher because you'll be able to have up to a plus three bonus to hit on your weapon attacks, so you're going to much more reliably land Stunning Strikes as a weapon-based uh, dex monk than as an unarmed-based dexterity monk. Unarmed dexterity monks are somewhat uncommon in Baldur's Gate because of Tavern Brawler being so oppressive and sort of choking out that playstyle, but uh, this build does have significant advantages over that because of the bonus chance to hit that you get with your Stunning Strikes. Finally, at monk level 6, we get access to the... Uh, way of the open hand bonus features, all of which are incredibly powerful because we get one uh, key empowered strikes is really nice because it means our offhand attacks will break through enemy resistances to non magical damage, which is great because it some enemies will have resistance to non magical damage and will have been ignoring some of the damage from our offhand attacks at this point or our unarmed attacks up to this point, but the, that will solve that problem. You also get the manifestation of body, mind, or soul. Usually you're going to use soul for this because radiant damage has a couple cool combos with it um, that lets you add a whole bunch more damage to your offhand flurries, and you get wholeness of body, which gives you an extra bonus action and lets you refresh key points and add a bunch of healing. Wholeness of body plus um, fighters... Uh, healing action gives this character actually quite a lot of self-healing, a surprising amount of self-healing between uh, the two abilities, so this character can keep going for a lot longer than you think. But mostly this ability is used for the extra bonus action, so that takes the number of attacks that you can do in a turn from 6 to 8, meaning that you are outputting a massive number of attacks in a turn with uh, two 
main hand attacks, action surge for a second pair of main hand attacks, and then flurry twice with your double bonus action for eight total attacks. That means that this character is outputting enormous damage, and so any effects you have that increase your damage are applying over and over again throughout the turn, so any effects that you get, like items that add extra damage dice to your attacks, will be uh, eight times as valuable on this character. This character then gets to play with basically whatever great items you find that you want to make use of. You don't have you have very few specific item requirements. I highly recommend using a plus three weapon in your main hand or a weapon that just adds a lot of extra damage dice. So, but any of the legendary weapons are pretty good. They will scale off your dexterity, something that you normally can't do, and it will make your attacks very accurate. You are also looking for anything that increases your damage dice per attack. Special mention to the flawed Helldusk gloves, because it buffs both weapon attacks and unarmed attacks, and so works for both halves of your kit, uh, as well as working perfectly on your ranged weapons. You're going to want the best bow that you can find, and for this character, I recommend the Deadshot uh, as the bow of choice, because the passive improved critical works just fine on your main hand attacks, so your melee attacks will benefit from the improved critical, even if you're actually making melee attacks. You're also going to want, probably because you're a dexterity build, you're going to want one of the medium armors that allows you to use your full dexterity, so that's going to give you some of the highest available AC in the game with just a normal shield and the armor of agility. We have 24 AC. And then also because we have Manifestation of Soul and can do radiant damage regularly, this character is a great uh, person to apply Radiating Orb, which is one of the most powerful effects in the game and can single-handedly shut down bosses. Radiating Orb reduces enemy attack rolls, so if you do this four times in a turn, that gives the enemy a minus four penalty to attack rolls, uh, and you can do this over and over again throughout your turns, giving the any opponents that you're facing a significant hit chance penalty, which of course combined with the fact that you have 24 AC means you're completely locking down melee enemies. Um, other than that, you are really not gear dependent at all on this character. You can use any utility gear you find that is uh, useful. Um, anything with bonuses to initiative is good because this character gets plus five initiative, but more initiative is always excellent. And anything that adds to your damage is also, of course, awesome. Um, one thing that's great about this character, though, is that it is not gear dependent at all because you can use pretty much any weapon that you find, any armor that you find, and it will all work very well. Uh, you can use versatile weapons in uh, as long as they don't have the actual two-handed property. So you can use stuff like Nyrolna as well if you want. Uh, a fun item as well that I should mention actually is early game is the Baneful Basher because you can use that to reduce enemy saves and then land stunning strikes and stuff more easily um, or maneuvers and stuff more easily. But late game, you're going to want higher level uh, weapons than that. All right, my friends, hope you've enjoyed this look at the true master of battle, the most versatile character in Baldur's Gate. Um... A character who can use any weapon, any fighting style, and fill any role in any party. I think it's really fun to play this character just in general because you can swap what you're doing so often in a way that martial characters often don't get to do. And this character really gets to change your strategy based on the situation, which is really fun uh, to execute and also very powerful. If you've enjoyed the video, of course, feel free to leave a comment and like the video. Uh, both of those things help me out a ton with the algorithm, and I really do appreciate everyone who takes the time to do that. I also very much appreciate those of you who take the time to leave kind words uh, for me in the comments. It really means a lot. I do read every comment that I get, and I... Uh, unfortunately, no longer I'm able to reply to all of them just because of the volume of comments, but I do definitely read them all, and I really appreciate everyone who uh, takes the time to let me know what they thought about the video, good or bad. And of course, you can subscribe to my channel for more of this and other strategy game content. Cheers, folks. I'll catch you next time.